Vincent Bouillard, welcome to the Running Lawn Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, what a privilege to finally meet you, uh, not yet in person, but at least through a screen. I should be saying that you <laughs> you've done so many amazing things in the sport. Like I'm I'm privileged to meet you. It's uh, super exciting to have this conversation. I'm I'm glad that the pleasure is comes from both. Um, I do want to mention that after UTMB, you you sent me a message because I think I posted a few stories uh, from from your race when I was uh, watching and cheering you from the A station in Valrhusine before and after that. And you wrote something like, "Okay, I wasn't able to to see the the stories on Instagram because they, you know, they expired." But um, like you've always been an inspiration to me, and yeah, an athlete that I have admired a lot, admired a lot. Um, so I was like, "Wow, like it's um, yeah, it's crazy." I didn't really think I could be an inspiration to to someone uh, who eventually was going to win UTMB. You know, not not because it's not possible, but like, I don't feel in a position where I can really teach or inspire someone. Um, so yeah, um, it like made me think about my, my, my career, my trajectory in the sport. And if I was able to inspire you a little bit, I'm super, super grateful. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, um, Yeah, it took me it took me some time to read through uh, <laughs> all the messages, and uh, it's it, it's good that I was following you. So like it was in my like people that I'm already following messages because otherwise like there's a whole lot of other messages that unfortunately I still haven't had the time to fully read. But um, but yeah, like um, just coming from you for me like it's it's really it's it just it doesn't hurt when I see something and realize that like yeah you shared something about me like yeah that just doesn't compute because uh yeah i've looked up to athletes like you and i think you in particular because of how you you know like trail running is a growing sport but like you're a runner and you've accomplished many things on many different distance and terrains and um yeah i think i would um uh, i guess associate myself like it would resonate really well with me um and uh yeah and being european uh you i think you live not too far from where i grew up on the other side of the Alps. so yeah just i had had uh, lots of uh admiration with uh the way you've approached the sport and different racing um yeah racing scenes that uh that you've done so and then uh involvement i followed from uh i guess outside but the uh construction of the uh, ptra and uh, all of the ongoing important conversations that are, are driven by by the group so yeah lots of admiration for sure thank you yeah i appreciate it a lot and i i do think we have a similar background maybe we'll we'll talk about that later um but yeah first i just wanted to to catch up with you and see how you're doing and uh yeah where are you at the moment I think you just finished the training camp yeah. with the French national team, right? Like, uh, I saw you were training with athletes like uh, Sylvain Cachard and Thibaut Varagnan, Baptiste Sarsan, yeah. uh, Mathieu Blanchard. And I, I think it was a, this was also like a first experience for you, like training with the national team, right? Yes, absolutely. So it's the, the many very kind messages that I had post UTMB. One of them was from uh, uh, Adrien Seguré, who is a national coach for trial running for France. And uh, yeah, he was uh, saying um, congratulations and that he yeah, he had uh, basically thought of uh, inviting me to this national training camp that was happening uh, so last week, so at the end of, of September, in the center of the country, as uh, kind of we're, we're far from any major championship. There's no more that are happening this year, but it's Kind of a larger group gathering ahead of of uh, championships happening next year uh with the purpose to yeah just gather the team for the coach and the staff to know more athletes and for athletes like me and others who's it would be a first time in the in that group to have a first experience ahead of the championship as like anticipating for potential uh selection or or yeah potential 
attempt to get into uh, uh, international championships. So yeah, I'm super grateful for the experience. It was uh, amazing to have the staff around and, and be able to, you know, get like a, honestly, it was my first week seriously back into some training and it's the perfect setup when you have physio and doctors around you every day. Uh, but also, yeah, just spend time with uh, some some of these athletes I knew already, Sylvain through Hoka and, and Baptiste, because uh, we, we raced twice together, same for Mathieu this year. Um, but uh, just a lot more time to to get to know each other um, during training, but also outside of uh, training hours. So, yeah, it was a great, um, great, great few days. And uh, now I'm back in NC at home here. And uh, yeah, doing good. Still trying to keep up on the. I did take some delay in a lot of work things, so try to catch up on that. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you have to go back to work straight to work after your UTMB, or did you have some time off and yeah, really time to recover and and also soak up the moment and uh, let the experience sink in. Um. So I guess it's a little complicated because it's not like a. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, autonomy in how I manage my time at work. So cool. yeah, I can my schedule the way I want, but uh, I wasn't able to completely take time away and not check in on work. I was able to do lighter days to mostly, well, accommodate for a lot of major requests were nice, but also, well, take more time on the, on the calendar that I hadn't accounted for. Um, so no real like break per se, even during the training camp last week, I was checking on a couple of things. Um, so I'm looking forward to probably later in the year, have a, a formal like break and, and stay away from the computer for good. Um, so yeah, that will come. But at the same time, it's my work schedule has enough flexibility that uh, yeah, it allows for typically participating in a training camp and, and yeah, so. That's really cool. Um, I mean, lots of things must, must be pretty new to you after this UTMB victory. Um, and one thing I was wondering, um, is like how, how your life has really changed if it has in a way, because like before UTMB, I was really reflecting on like many times we think that after an athlete achieves something very important, something that is widely regarded as a success that that single thing is going to change your life. And honestly, it's something that has never happened to me because my life has always been pretty, you know, pretty similar. Like as a, yeah, you, you grow, you, you, you know, you take opportunities, but maybe it's because I haven't won big enough races or whatever, but I think it's a common misconception that a lot of people have that, you know, sometimes after, after a huge achievement, like a, an Olympic medal or like a winning UTMB, like in your case, this is going to bring uh, like great opportunities and it may, it may truly change your life in some ways. But at the same time, I think it doesn't change uh, the person you are. Like it doesn't magically fix your problems or change your personality. Um, and I think this is a risk we are, we are all exposed to because we are kind of always under pressure to achieve the next thing and to answer the question, now what's next? And sometimes we don't even have the time to, you know, enjoy the achievement and feel the gratitude for what you just did and also share it with the people around you that are yeah. meaningful for you. So how does that make you feel? And yeah, like practically how how is your situation now compared to how it was just a little over a month ago? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I align a lot with what how you described it and that it can change things, but um, fundamentally, it, I don't think it changes us as persons or like that's really what I'm working towards, that it like it shouldn't change who I am. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess to coming to what I was coming back to what I was saying earlier, because we haven't like Camila and I have re really haven't had time to like settle and rest fully. It's like almost there's been back to back like whether it's interviews or opportunities like well going to the training camps or um it's funny like two weeks before utmv we were just moving into the apartment so all the walls are white partially because we still haven't like fully moved in so there's just a lot of things on every day that like keep us busy on things that are 
related to UTMB and things that aren't. So in ways, it's just like for now, we're just looking forward to having time where we're like, okay, we're going to, to do nothing for a few couple of days. And I think that's when be able to fully reflect. Um, but where also I link align with you is that, well, it, it's not, I don't think it's quite the same scope as an Olympic medal, but it does come with some opportunities that yeah. uh, I I don't want to run away from and I don't want to disregard because yeah, some of the things that uh, can be triggered from from this win can be really interesting. Like, uh, well, one example, again, the training camp last week and talking about uh, potential international competitions like uh, world championships or things like it's it's very hypothetical at this point. But uh, those are things that I, I want to start thinking about and yeah, understand better what are those possibilities and uh, what excites me the most uh, while continuing on a journey that fundamentally it's not that it's going to change completely from where it was prior to winning UTMB. It's just that like, oh, now I've reached a point where I have a lot more options in front of me. So um, yeah, it, so far we're just, yeah, I guess just busy. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I think those options are starting to kind of material that materialize themselves a little more clearly. Yeah. And uh yeah no it's exciting it's exciting for sure yeah yeah yeah, it takes time and i agree it's more like uh having a wider range of options in front of you which is uh really exciting if you can take them but um yeah i was also thinking like when right after the race they ask you hey you just won utmb how does it feel like you never know how to answer and uh, like after a big achievement we are like we all have like three, four days where we need to let everything sink in. And we also have like practical needs like eating and catching up yeah. with sleep and recovery. Yeah. But also another common experience that I've had is that once you go back home, like you have so many things to do because like when you go to a race, it's like your life is paused for a few days and then you leave everything behind, like your work, your relationship and everything. And uh, like you, you never really take the time to reflect on what's happened, what it means, what it means for us. Like, like I also wonder if there is always any meaning behind, besides the fact that yeah, you won a big race, you are under the spotlight, you were able to put together a great performance and display the best version of yourself when it mattered the most. But like, even after my race at OCC. I don't know if I really took the time to reflect on what I did and what happened and what it means and everything. So it's more like, I don't know, everything is mixed together. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel? Sure. I think one thing that helped me is that, because for me, it's like, I mean, so my wife Camila was here throughout the entire race and before yeah. we had friends, I had family. So it was like a lot of my close network world was either here or following along on, on the internet and messaging me. So that part, in ways, it's the days after that I was able to fully enjoy all the emotions that people felt throughout the race because I yeah, took the time to read messages and it was amazing. Like I had some long group conversations that I like caught up on with like screenshots of the live and things were like, oh, this is fantastic to read through. Uh, but at the same time, I also, well, yeah, coming back to NC, um, it was like, oh yeah, we still have our apartment to like open boxes and furnish. And so like coming back to reality, like doing laundry, unpacking, like just like normal stuff. Yeah, normal stuff. One of the things I liked was uh, we had some work, work meetings that were scheduled, uh, I think the Tuesday, the weekend before. And uh, yeah, some of the meetings we had, like the people we were meeting with, they had no idea what UTMB was. And I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> we can have another, you know, like kind of a icebreaker conversation than like what happened over the weekend. Um, because it's uh, in my personality, it's again, like I'm not trying to say I want to run away from the spotlight. Otherwise, it's like, well, don't come to UTMB to begin with. But at the same time, it's not where I strive the most. Like, I'm okay that, okay, let's talk about something else. And there's <laughs> other things that can happen that are really fun on a, on a given weekend. So it was a mix of both. Um, but yeah, what's new is uh, is for sure all the media interviews and things that uh, well, hopefully I'm yeah. doing not too much repeating myself and uh, and uh, 
yeah, I think there's, again, like I guess I just said that, but like it's a, when we take perspective, it's even though it's the biggest event and it's the most media and stuff, it's still a relatively small community of trail running. So within our bubble, and especially for me living in Nancy, sometimes you feel like it's the number one sport in the world. And it's like, no, no, no. If you if you go to Paris or bigger cities, it's like, mm, no, it's actually not that big, but, you know. Not that big of a deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it helps you keep your feet on the ground sometimes. Uh, but what you mentioned about, um, you know, the meetings with uh, your work meetings with Hoka. Yeah. I, w- I was listening to the interview that you did post race with Dylan. Yeah. And uh, you started working with Hoka the same year that Jim Wobsley signed for Hoka. Yeah. And uh, when you started working as an engineer, you didn't even know who Jim was. You know, and it's kind of like the same thing, but you now you're on the opposite side. <laughs> so it's kind yeah. of funny. Yeah, I think it's part of the reason we we bonded in a way, because uh, mm-hmm. even when he joined the uh, kind of brand conference for the first time, it was actually my first time flying to like traveling to California as well. And like, yeah, there was a group run in the morning and everyone I think was excited for this new star that was coming and like joining the group run and like I had no idea who anyone was. So I just chatted with a guy that happened to be Jim Wamsley and I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so um yeah, we it's because the timing I think aligned on both of us being new to the organization and sharing a few runs. And then I was working on some athlete specific prototypes for those first few years. And um yeah, we became um we became friends and then close friends and then stayed in touch and uh yeah yeah after year we've uh we've become to to be really close friends with uh um uh, uh, jess jim uh, camilla and i shared some vacation and stuff so yeah truly something special that uh well, leaving his utmb win last uh last year and then uh some moments this year that were that were incredible. Uh, of course, it was it was sad that he had to to drop and that was dealing he was dealing with the injury. But um, yeah, looking back, some of the photos and videos like uh, at La Flegere things. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So amazing that he was he was there to support you and yeah. I also felt in a similar way uh, last year when he won UTMB. Like I was maybe happier for his race than for my own achievement you know i had a great race i I was second at occ but then i got to to watch him in in valor scene and then i was trying to follow him a little bit Mm -hmm. uh just a day a couple of days after my race and then i was watching the finish and uh yeah it was it was so intense and um this year we met like i was running I think it was two days before the race um, and I was running, it was pretty late at night uh, after a full days of uh, events and meetings with, with Nike. And one of the few people that I met on trails was Jim and I took it as a, you know, good sign for the race. <laughs> so it felt like, nice. yeah, uh, a yeah. pretty, pretty nice, nice thing, but it is, is for sure a special person that I, yeah, we've had a good relationship since we, we raced each other. Um, yeah, we had a really, really good race in Patagonia at the 2019 World Mountain Running Championship. Um, yeah. where he won, and uh, I really challenged him that time, so it was cool. Yeah. Um, you briefly mentioned about your role, your work with Hoka, mm-hmm. and I know you've had different roles within within the company, and. Uh, I know your work has directly contributed to the footwear you wore during UTMB, the Hoka Tecton X 2.5. I think it's an evolution of Hoka Tecton 2 and maybe the previous version of the Hoka Tecton X3. Um, how what what does your job at Hoka involve? Like, I come from a physics background, um, oh. and I specialize in like the yeah, science of materials. So I know a little bit about that kind of stuff. So uh, it's uh, it's super interesting. Yeah. So I um, so I studied yeah uh, material science and engineering in college. And so I was doing like research on plastics recycling and very much fundamental research stuff. And uh, 
I joined Hoka because I was curious and I had no idea how shoes were made and how much, basically how much science there was in, in product. And uh, is there a lot? <laughs> there is, there is, there is, but uh, it's also footwear is this, uh, this in between of you can put a lot of science, but at the end of the day, what's going to make or break the performance of a shoe is when someone steps in the pair of shoe and tells you how it feels and try and go run with it. Right. Because all of the data and calculation in the world, maybe all of your data-driven science will tell you X, Y, and Z. And then when an athlete puts it on, it's like, actually, I don't feel that great. And so- Yeah, yeah. One thing is the lab and then is the reality, you know, <laughs> it's very two very different things. Yeah. I think I had heard or read in an interview some sometime that uh, someone said like, it's easier to build satellites than shoes because satellites, you just follow the calculation, the science, and it's like very precise. For shoes, it's, it's a little more complex because there is some- well, margins of errors and, and things that are inconsistent. So, um, but yeah, so my role has evolved, as you mentioned, and I've worked uh, between basically the two spheres that are innovation and engineering. So engineering is the closest to like that scientific approach of answering technical questions or helping solve problems that the, the product creation team, so design, development, product marketing, don't have the time or bandwidth to answer. So say they're working on the new Tecton and all of a sudden it's like, hey, we were thinking of this design, but like we're really not sure if it's going to affect the performance of this way or what not, or we have a question on the material selection, like I'll come in and say like, all right, well, based on some history of product or competitor analysis, like I would recommend doing this or that, maybe run some tests. Um, so that's really the engineering side. Um, in recent years, it's been super exciting because of the huge jumps we've seen in footwear technology, um, the, all of the phones and, and progresses that were made in, in this type of materials and uh, combination with uh, like uh, composite material for, for plates and shanks. So that part is really fascinating and uh, connects with a lot of our manufacturing partners that are mostly in Asia. Um, and then the other part of my role is, I guess, a little further away from like a specific product because for innovation, it can be like bigger span research, like a open question topic. So like, hey, like, oh, I guess I can't really quote examples. It's hard because a lot of this is like just confidential, but it can be, yeah, it's not like we're working on 50 years from, from now, but uh, three to five years scope of uh, trying to answer a bigger problem or help to target a specific strategy that the brand has identified. So uh, yeah, just, I guess, a little broader problems that uh, it's really fascinating too, because yeah. you take learnings from other industries, other like research areas and, and yeah, try and kind of mix universes and, and do lots of trials and errors. Yeah. Cool. How much is it driven by marketing versus like technology and maybe your like your input and what athletes want you know i feel like it's a it's always a little bit of a balance not necessarily what is the most beneficial for like from a design or technology perspective is what the marketing wants um so i don't know how do you see that yeah i mean i can only speak for my own experience and and yeah. have worked at Hoka for all my career. Hoka started with really like aiming to solve a, a, a problem by something that is very straightforward. It's like running downhill is really painful. And they said like, okay, like if we look at all the footwear equipment, it really hasn't changed. Like the landscape is pretty much same type of volumes. And they proposed something that at the time looked completely unheard of and clown shoes and like yeah. everyone was laughing at it. And so I, I really think that even if you have a marketing point of view on, on product, like you, you still build your range and architecture by, you should be able to define the brief of a product in like your 10 seconds. What's your description of like, hey, this shoe, this, this product does this, this and that. If you're not able to do this, that means that you probably maybe have over complexified and you need to come back to some simpler basis. Um, so that's a, it's a great question because uh, 
I like to say that I'm not a great tester myself. I love to test things, but I try not mix my feedback with kind of like the general test reports we do because I, in ways, could be happy with very simple product, if, like knowing what I want and how I use it. It's like, yeah, I don't need all of the bells and whistles all the time. But the work of marketing is also to to segment ways so that uh, for specific consumers, it's going to resonate really well. Like for trail running, for example, the needs are completely different whether you live in Southern California or yeah. in the Alps or in the Pyrenees. Like it's completely different type of uh, discipline and yet it's all called trail running. So yeah. the work of marketing is to work typically a lot with like consumer insight to very very precisely define okay why would we need the new speed code to do better grip in those conditions compared to become lighter weight like which one's more important so yeah it's cool i'm not a marketer but it you know it's always fun to work uh work with people that have just a different point of view and approach on on developing product yeah what's what you just mentioned is uh is very important i think the the specificity of the product and the people that are going to use this product is something that is not always really taken into account, I feel. Um, but yeah, super, super interesting to to reflect on, on those things. Um, last question related to, to the product, just because I, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, we've seen the evolution of super shoes on the road and carbon plated shoes on the road. And I think we are only starting to see some interesting innovation in trail uh, with some attempts to to build what we call super shoes um, for trail running. Uh, how do you see this evolution? And do you think like, like obviously I think we're not yet at the level that there is on, on road and uh, mm -hmm. from a prob problem solving perspective, I think it's much more difficult to build a, super shoes for trails. Um, do you think there will, there will ever be one? And uh, maybe how far are we from from that point? I always like to start the answers on super shoes by asking what is the strict scientific definition of super shoes? Because the line is blurred and, you know, like is, well, science says that like, sure, there's combination of several factors that make gains in certain performance areas, but anyway. I understand your point, and I think what's fascinating with trail is that, again, depending on where it is, what course, what terrain, what distance, the biomechanical pattern is very different and less predictable than on a road marathon that, for the most part, sure, the stride is going to degrade from the first 5K to the last 5K, but it's, it's a lot easier to kind of summarize it under a uh, repetitive pattern that you simulate on a computer and then try and do calculation. If you take UTMB course, well, already you have to anticipate for depending on the type of weather and how muddy or dry it is going to be completely different. Uh, someone who runs it in 20 hours versus 40 hours, completely different, you know? So there's a lot of that that I guess complexifies, but uh, some of the learnings can apply and that's why we've seen different attempts to well yeah already changing the the behavior on the, the type of product that that we were and uh i'm sure you must have tried it yourself as a as a runner and felt differences but uh, i think what's cool in trails is that there's always a fine line of balance in terms of well stability versus how bouncy something can get like why wouldn't you use the latest Vaporfly or Alphafly to run all these seeds. Barely longer than a marathon. Come on, you should run faster, you know? Yeah. So I think we'll continue to see progress, but as the sport grows, it also will direct what type of shoe maybe makes more sense. And yeah, again, whether we're talking about Western States type of course or uh, super rocky, like next year's world championship in the Pyrenees, I'm sure are going to be very different than a, a Western state type of uh, terrain. So there might be just a continuation of exploration depending on the type of trail running we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, like, it's almost like uh, for a shoe company, they need to build a model that is specific for that race, for those athletes 
almost yeah uh, instead of like trying to come up with a model that works for everything and everyone so yeah yeah the, 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 it's a tight it, balance yeah. it's uh it's going to be interesting because i think it's really related to how the discipline continues to grow and mm -hmm. cool where the sport goes. uh going back to your race um thinking about the start like at the start did you believe you had a sub 20 hour performance in your legs um like how confident were you in your own means and the training block that you had leading up to to utmb not 20 not sub 20 hours definitely not no sub 20 okay no no uh, no because <laughs> you sub know regardless of the position at the finish i think you kind of have in mind what performance you have in your legs like i think on a smaller scale i experienced something similar at series in 2016 when i was third because like nobody knew me at the start but i knew i had a good time in my my legs if the execution yeah. would go right and um I think it's it's really nice in those circumstances because you don't you don't feel any pressure like you just go there to do your own thing and yeah. um and yeah and when it happens you know you maybe end up on the podium or like in your case you end up winning the race and everyone is surprised but you actually knew that yeah you kind of had this performance in your legs yeah no absolutely i think there's a lot of of that in my case because uh well i wasn't 100 confident and sure that i was going to even well even finish yeah <laughs> i mean it was your first utmb so yeah and and because of that there's there was a huge part of unknown in my preparation because i trained i was really happy with the training block but i don't have a coach and i've never done this type of training before meaning like i just bought my first pair of poles this spring before maxi race which i did oh. in the beginning of june so i i've been on this terrain for almost my entire life but i've never trained at that level with that volume so there was a part of like did i do enough did i do too much uh did i do the right thing etc um but i i had precise goals in terms of timing and sections like even though it was my first utmb because i've been to the events so many times I like it felt like I knew the course like a, the back of my hand like it was a weird feeling of even compared to races I did last year in the US like I had to really study the course and like memorize and I had flashcards and stuff this felt like I, I knew it exactly like I knew section by section what the references history times were and so I think because of that and because of well it was like a dream race that I had been training for um Actually, uh, Camila helped me a lot in like psychologically have an approach that was probably a lot more uh, maybe aggressive than I would have typically in saying like, hey, like, what are you, what are you going in there for? Like, what is your true goal? You know, and trying to define A, B, C type of uh, type of goals and and and. <laughs> Like admit to myself, uh, kind of like, no, no, I, I think I can run this fast. And, and I think if everything goes right, I should be able to run. Basically, my, my timing reference in mind was to have, if everything was aligned, under 22 hours and get close to 21, which the first times that I admitted that to myself, I was like, this is insane. That's like, that should be top 10 easy. And like, who am I to say that? I've never run UTMB. Like, that's crazy. And uh, I was even like afraid to say that too much around even to friends because yeah, I, I think if to anyone you say that, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. it's a scary, scary goal for sure. It's a scary goal. And like, you're like, all right, and like, who is this guy? He thinks he's like, he can just come and do that for his first try. But, um, but yeah, I think it was just psychologically a bit of an exercise to, to admit that like, no, no, I think if things go go well and I do what I know I can do uh I don't see why like I, basically for everyone it gets hard at some point and yeah. what I've seen at UTMB is that there's always a big low point in the race like no one's ever done a complete full like green 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 everything goes right throughout the entire thing 
And so you know that you're going to suffer. It's just a matter of like how much you can, okay, it eventually is going to get better. And uh, yeah, I was ready to, I guess, go to battle and suffer. And uh, uh, yeah, it's easier to reflect on this when everything goes right. And you say like, yeah, I did it. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, I was I was mentally prepared to execute the plan, uh, but it was not, even in my most optimistic, uh, uh, it was not sub-20. Like I think I had basically a, like, had based on uh, Thibaut Garivier is a good friend of mine and he yeah. 2110 or low 20 uh, t- between 21 and 2110 last year and had taken his time plus minus three percent or something so it, yeah ended up faster than that but yeah well, there was definitely a big psychological step of accepting yeah I have so many questions on on this answer <laughs> uh first I think like so was was your race like did you have any any low moments during the race or was it always like green light green light green light like was it always pretty smooth as it, as it looked from the outside or i mean you just mentioned that for athletes who came and won utmb before you there's always been some kind of like yeah low low moment for definitely for Jim last year, even for Killian two years before. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, they, they managed to, to come back and, and close the race very, very strong. Um, what is, was it always like pretty smooth for you? No, I definitely had a low, a low point, um, but it was actually earlier in the race than for Jim and Killian in the past two years. For me, it was a, uh, just after Le Contamine. Um, oh, wow. It's very early. Weird. Yeah, arriving up to Le Contamine, I, I was starting to think maybe the rhythm is a little too fast for me and I need to just accept that the guys are going to go and I'm going to take my own pace. And uh, during the S station, everything goes super fast. Like it's a really crowded S station. And like I, I think it was good because I, I like, well, you know, I was there to help and we had our just like process and focus and. I didn't bother looking <clears throat> around at who was leaving and who was passing me. And I left and I was uh, running a little bit with Mathieu Blanchard for like the first kilometers. Um, and the beginning of that time, I really didn't feel that great. I started to have like stomach um, pains and I think maybe it was a bit of stress related. Um, just the stomach doesn't feel, not feeling right. And very quickly, mentally, you start to build like negativity and like, oh my God, okay, that's it. I started way too fast. I'm just going to blow up. I'll try and see if I can make it to Cormier, but like this is going to be a long, painful night. And I and I think it mentally, so I saw two of my family members at uh, uh, Ban there and they were cheering and I was like, okay, like, well, that's it. Like I'm suffering and maybe it's going to get better. So I took that time uh easier and some groups caught up on me I actually climbed a bit with katie who was uh insanely fast but on, on yeah. pace um and yeah things got better even once i reached the top i was starting to feel a little better and then the descent felt good and uh i think it helped me mentally to be like okay i've had a rough patch i've come over it so i'm ready for another to come and like maybe it will be longer maybe it will be harder but like that's that's a bit of what the ultra I think effort is about is just managing when you have low moments, accepting that everyone had those and it's just like how you can deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, early on and I think at the end too, but at the end everyone's mm. up. I mean it didn't look like because the the last four hundred meters you sprinted to the finish <laughs> and the uh, well, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I so I actually suffered a lot on the climb to Lac Légère because yeah. uh, so I forgot a flask at Valorcine um, and I realized that very early because it was really hot and I was very dehydrated. Um, yeah, missing 500 milliliter of fluid and calories and liquid was not the move to make at uh, that point. So the climb felt very long, mostly because like I was really dehydrated and my head was starting to spin with... Ironically, all the chairs were also like making my head spin a little bit. So 
that was a uh, yeah and just hard but also it's like okay it's the last one so i can make it to the top and then uh safely go uh go down to to town but yeah no and like i would i think i was mentally preparing for a big big explosion moment whether for muscles or like uh not having eaten enough and uh yeah i was able i think because i was on high alert of anticipating for that um i I really have the feeling that I, I ran a bit of a conservative race and never, never being completely in the red. Wow, cool. Um, I think another key moment of your race is when you passed Jim Wamsley on the downhill to Courmayeur. And in that moment, Jim told you that there was no one in front of you, like that you were in the lead of UTMB. Um, in some of the interviews that I listened, people were asking you, like, what went through your mind in that in that moment, um, and I was thinking how maybe in those moments you don't even realize because, at least for me, it's always like a, I'm always so focused on myself and like the competition is always within myself and I'm always trying to pay attention to what I'm feeling. Yeah. and not too much to what others are doing or like yeah what it means now that i'm in you know i'm in the lead of utmb um but i think at the same time you, you shared a few words with jim and also there is a like the personal relationship that you have uh with him so yeah, yeah can you maybe recall a few memories from that moment yeah yeah indeed like i thought there was another runner up front and so when he quickly told me that like no it's I'm taking the lead. I just, I think, I, I think I must have laughed and saying like, oh but yeah, okay, no, it's not, that's not the move that I was supposed to make. Um, but then it was also a little, well, I guess I was disappointed for him because he was suffering and and he was telling me that he was going to take it easy and see, like, take a long rest in Pomaya and see how things went. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was basically disappointed for him, and then. I think, yeah, exactly what has you said, as much as uh, for a quick moment, I must have had a thought of like, wait, what's happening? Why am I taking the lead? Like, this is crazy. I I try to really just focus on my own effort and to that kind of like check all of the status, all of the radars and like, no, no, but like I'm feeling good. I don't think this place is unreasonable. I'm still within the time windows that were my expectations. Uh, I I had absolutely no thought of like, wow, okay, I'm going to win. It was like, oh, for now I'm in the lead because the others are probably a little smarter and, and taking it more conservatively, but like they're going to come back on me. Like for sure they're going to come back on me. So it was more a question of, okay, I'm feeling good. I don't have a problem being in the lead if right now I'm in the lead. And it's just, it, it's time that I gain and that uh, is is like is taken. If I take three minutes now, it's three minutes now. And at the end, it's just you know, it's just the addition of when you take those times. So, um, uh, yeah, even like leaving the aid station in Cormayeur, like uh, Camille had made a, a really great choice of sitting right near the exit, so that when I was sitting and like focused on my transition, I didn't even look back at who was coming in. And so I like didn't even turn around to see how many people were there and how far back they would come back. And I immediately was like, nope, I'm just going to continue and focus and see, like, see what happened. And so it was funny even to watch uh, a video and see that Germain left like, I think 20 seconds behind or something like I had no idea. And at the same time, I was very prepared for him to catch up, but I was like, yeah, we'll see if he catch up, he catch up, but just doing my thing. Yeah. 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 So cool. Um, yeah, also there, there's a quote from, from Jim and something that I, I think really applies to what you just mentioned and, uh, is very relatable for any athlete. Uh, it's from a, an interview that he had before Western state this year. And he, he said, when you feel good, run good. And when you don't feel good, listen. So mm -hmm. like you really have to take advantage of the moments when you feel good yeah. and like you check all the boxes and and if you get an okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and then when things get tough, 
uh, yeah, try to really understand why and and always like try to stay positive that the situation can always change um, and make sure you're, you know, you're doing everything you can to to stay on top of the situation, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, my version that I try to repeat myself in an ultra is that uh, if things are not going well, it's usually not going to last very long. If things are going well, it's usually not going to last very long. So it's probably <laughs> being prepared for like, well, it's going to tilt the other way. And then, well, it's going to tilt back to it and managing kind of the balance in between those two. Because it's truly like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think we'll, we'll see in future years and pretty much maybe very soon people that are able to pull a like, complete full effort with like flawless, not a single down moment on something like UTMB. Because we're starting maybe to see that more on, on Western states. That's a little shorter, but yeah, it's uh, within everyone at their level, within reason. It's always managing how you're balancing the the limit of yeah fatigue, hydration, muscular pain. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah that that makes me makes me think that there is a, a pretty big mar margin because, like, as you mentioned if someone like nails the race and has a great day and does everything right, you can run even faster, you know, and in the shorter distance, maybe there is a little bit less of that. Like the races are, it's not like they're flawless, but like, yeah, there is less room for mistake. And yeah, yeah you, it's a lot of suffering, but it's a different type of suffering. It's just, yeah, another effort and you're only able to take up so much pain, uh, so much, yeah. so much effort, uh, at a given rate. So yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's fun to, to think about it. For sure. Yeah. Well, that, that means that next year you try and get your TMB and nail it. And... <laughs> I don't, a... I don't think I'm, I'm ready. I'll be ready next year, but yeah, eventually is something that I think I'd like to try for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your training leading up to the race because you mentioned it was uh, it was really good. Um, can you maybe put some numbers and um, talk a little bit about yeah how you balanced your training with uh, your daily life and your your job? Mm -hmm. There is yeah one of one of the headlines after UTMB was you know, a full-time Hoka Shui engineer uh, just got the win at UTMB. So I think a lot of people are interested in understanding how you you can achieve such high performances, but while still having a full-time job. Yeah. Well, I want to start by saying that I think a lot of those headlines are also due to the fact that I was not sponsored. And I think a lot of people make, make the probably make the confusion between what it means to be a professional athlete versus a sponsored athlete. Because in reality, in our sport, the majority of sponsored athletes also have uh, something else on the side, whether they have a full profession and they manage like a, something that has nothing to do with the sport, or they are active in producing content and media and things like we're doing right now. You know, it's like, is your job to be a podcast host or is it running? Like, it's, it's just yeah. a... Time management is for everyone. Um, and, but yeah, for me, so coming back to your question on, on the, yeah, managing my schedule, um, I think my training planning is very, is a little boring, but, but it worked for me in the, in trying to be very, very um, precise in the mileage progression week over week. Um, I've dealt with some injury issues in the past due to, I think, trying to ramp up too fast in, in mileage and not taking care of like strength work um, as I should. So it's like my biggest mileage week for this block was uh, 180, 180 kilometers and uh, 11,000 meters, which is the pretty much like just barely over UTMB, uh, but over the course of the week um and that was i guess probably three weeks prior to the race and then you pretty much remove 10 percent of that week by week uh give or take i have some 
ups and downs here and there to accommodate for some recovery. Uh, but that's just the, the volume evolution uh, and the format of the week itself is very consistent. It's uh, I keep one high intensity workout of uh, intervals of I change depending on how I feel and where, where I am too. Uh, but for this block, it was a lot of uphill threshold or uphill view to max um, intervals. And the rest is mostly zone one, zone two, sometimes zone three if I feel like it. And at least one longer run uh, on the weekend that uh, also I try and progress in how long the run is uh, as I get closer to the race. I had uh, always a minimum of one week, uh, one day with no running per week. So usually long bike ride in the summer, um, skiing in the winter, and yeah, that's so. No, yeah, so I think I I, <clears throat> I mentioned that in a in shoe discussion that I've had since the race, and people asking like, how do you manage that with the the full time job schedule? And it's funny because I've. I thought about that a lot in comparison to I have friends from college who still compete on like the 1500 the 5k on the track and I think that training for an ultra in ways is actually easier because if you want to move your run from Tuesday morning to Wednesday morning or lunchtime like it really doesn't matter if any if anything it helps you being more adaptable and like figure out how you deal with eating and maybe sometimes you have to run kind of not long after you you ate you know if you train for 800 or 15 and you have a specific high intensity workout to do it's better be doubt or like when you're doing it in the week because it's so precise and it's going to affect everything around so for sure there's more hours and well you have to have those hours to put so it's sacrifice that you make with uh, other other things in life um, but the fact that it's adaptive makes it easier. Um, like you can start very early on your weekend and practice running at night a little bit and that it was changing your sleep schedule and, and things like that. So the adaptability for me is, uh, is a key aspect to make it, it fit in the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very true that training for track and roads is, it's probably more precise in a way. Um, not that it is less difficult, but yeah, it's another type of commitment, I think. And when you're training for ultras, it's a lot more adaptable. And it, it's almost like it, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you do it exactly. sometime exactly. During, during the day, you know. But training for... Yeah, a track race or, or a road race is a lot more precise if you want to, to yeah. really perform at a high level. And I um, think for some people yeah. it's easier, but for me, another thing is that the, the mental aspect, like I remember when I was training at my own little level on the 15, it's like, if you have a hard workout that's coming up, you're going to think about it. You're going to like maybe stress a little bit about it. And that adds up in your fatigue versus when you do more hours and, and more volume, just like you say, it's almost like it doesn't matter, and it makes it brings everything to a level of normality that is like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll just go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, similar to me, you have a, a track a track background. Uh, you just mentioned that you were a miler. I I was able to only find a couple of your PRs: one fifty seven in the eight hundred meters and nine forty five nine thirty five in the steeplechase. Um, and uh, yeah, I I remember in in the podcast you recorded after UTMB with Dylan, you you mentioned that track for you came with a a lot of pressure because you really have to show up very fit and the effort is is short, so you only have that time to to really prove your fitness. And um, on trails, when you once you have your your plan, like you can adapt. It's a long-term management type of effort. Um, what I, I think you're still following a little bit the track and field and road running world, just like me, but uh, like, I mean, in trails, but I, I just like running in general. Um, what is it about track and field that, that attracts you? And 
like how is it helping you to perform on trails and what is it that yeah what is the challenge like what is challenging about that side of the sport that maybe applies to trail running um well i think there are several questions here like one like for me i had so years where i was training and, and trying to be competitive on the track where i also was in uh like college years and my studies that were challenging for me just from uh, like how many hours and the classes that i had and looking back at it i was just way over trained all the time i was training with friends that were a lot faster than me and I think uh, I did one year of uh, uh, like exchange program where I trained by myself because I was living uh, abroad and all of a sudden things went a lot better because I was training like at my pace. So I think I had a bit of a, uh, like a, a small burnout from, from competing on the track just because I was showing up to races like overly tired every time and it comes with like, well, okay, I, <laughs> I, I've always entered training. I've never had a problem with that. But then the time is like, oh, you're always disappointed um but i i still love track and field i think it's the sport for sure that i watch and follow the most i don't follow a lot of sports anymore but uh yeah Kimina and i we watch like everything track and field all year um and i think it's a it's an amazing sport because from very little kids ages it can bring into well practicing physical activity but it's something that it's very uh i don't know if you try to explain to a kid what the sport of track and field is about it's very simple to explain it's like well let's see who can run the fastest let's see who can jump the furthest you know it's kind of that aspect of like a sense of, of sports uh versus when i realized that i had been watching some winter sports all my childhood and the first time i had to explain to camilla what biathlon was about it's like it's a great sport but like when you think about it twice it's like oh my gosh yeah who thought about it and skiing and shooting and all that stuff <laughs> nothing against that. I think it's a great sport but yeah track and field to me has this just special feel to it and uh and and where the ties that I see with trail running I think for me it, running is just it's, it's the sport that surrounds it all and I believe and I might be wrong and maybe many people might disagree but I think trail running is going to evolve into much more than what it is today Because when we think about the definition of it, most people in the world run on trail. Like, depending on where you live, sure, the trails might not look the same at all and it might not be as easy. But if you give this, someone a choice between running on a sidewalk or something that's like a like, nice little smooth trail in the forest or something, like a lot of people actually are trail runners. They might not even know that the sport exists, but they're trail runners. And so, I'm excited to see how in the future, maybe those disciplines that for now are seen are very segmented and different can overlap. And yeah, if we see some of, I mean, reality also that track and field and road running, are, there, there's so much more density in all disciplines compared to, to trail running that like, as we see more of that coming into trail, it's going to be super exciting. And we start to see it a little bit with Golden Trail, and uh and notably east african athletes uh coming in and, and like it's amazing to see because it brings just athletes with very different background into you know confronting on uh competing on the same um yeah same formats so i, I think that's what for me like drives a lot of passion is to see how like those different type of uh, uh of athletes profiles and efforts can come together in in different type of events yeah 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 i think i i agree with you a lot um also the the track the roads kind of give you a mentality um an approach to training and competing that is is different from what i generally see on trails uh not to say that one is better than the other but I think as elite athletes, as pro athletes, we do need to aim at increasing the level of the competition, like always try to raise the bar, always looking for the the challenge, uh, the, the competition, the confrontation 
uh, mm -hmm. with the world's best athletes. So trail running is a sport that has developed in so many events and races and circuits. And I, sometimes I wish there, there was like, everything was a lot simpler, maybe to sim to oversimplify trail running would be a mistake because one of, one of its beauties is the variety that we have in the sport, but like, you know, one circuit where, where all the best go, uh, and where like all the good athletes are at the same start line, it still doesn't happen very often. And, um, yeah. It's for sure something that I wish to see, like, like it happens in track and field, you know, in the Diamond League or World Championship Olympic Games. It happens a little bit in the Golden Trail series and uh, for sure at UTMB and uh, maybe at the World Champs. But yeah, I think we still have a, a way to go. Probably. Yeah, absolutely. And if we take the relative perspective of the size of those sports, like, sure. Mm -hmm smaller that like even the biggest events are almost nothing compared to the density of uh yeah world champs for track or or because well it's also in terms of accessibility to the events like most people in the world aren't even aware that it exists uh, versus a lot more people are aware that there is olympic games every four years or like some sort of things that happen in a stadium because the sport is a, is a lot older but I agree with you. And I think that conflict of what series is also always going to be there. Because even if you follow on what's happening right now with Strike and Chill and Diamond League versus the Grand Slam and like other, yeah. it's pretty much the same, the same questions of like where the prize money should go and how it's not enough. And um, yeah, so I think the biggest opportunity for trail is just to reach a much broader audience and uh, grow outside of the little bubble that it it's been it's it's great that it's been growing in the way and it's continuing to increase in awareness but uh yeah there's, there's a lot a lot more in the future and i think it's exciting yeah yeah uh i would love to come back to the words that you shared just after the finish uh, on the finish line of UTMB. Um, two things really struck me. Um, one was the perspective of running professionally. Um, you didn't say no uh, to, you know, maybe the opportunity to to be a professional runner. Um, but also, I think you mentioned something very important about the freedom of not having any contract and not having any obligation and pressure to do any type of competition to remove any pressure that comes from social media. You're not present on social media very much. Uh, I mean, you have a private Instagram account. I think you have a Strava profile. Um, but I think social media are, are great on one hand, but they have also created some pretty unhealthy dynamics not just within sports, but yeah, as, as athletes, we do feel the pressure to be present and to go to, yeah. you know, to please our sponsors and, and all of that. And I, I thought your words on the simplicity and the freedom of, of running and competing were a blessing in a space that is often very driven by these dynamics. So, yeah, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, thanks for saying that. I think <laughs> it's funny because I, I didn't anticipate when I said that, that, uh, yeah, even like some people like claps in the finish line and things. And I think, yeah, you summarized it in saying that social media are an extremely powerful tool and they do enable so many great things. And like, I'm a user of social media every day. I don't produce content but i consume content on a daily basis and it's amazing in how it enables you to reach very precise type of information that you seek for and stuff but on the other hand it's also like well it has so many flaws and we don't need to get into that there's a lot of amazing documentary and, and explanation on why it's a extremely dangerous tool um i think for me i also was able to well coming to UTMB this year and enjoy the sport under the radar because I hadn't, you know, like 
performed at this level or on, on events that have this media. Um, so in ways, it's also a privilege that I was able to do the sport inside and, and not, not have to think about those things. Um, I am transparently, I'm actively thinking of what the best pass forwards can be. Um, because as I said before, I don't think there's a, like, I want to dissociate the idea of being a professional versus signing contracts because there can be either way or the other and one without the other, like being professional is almost more of a mindset than how much serious you want to put into your training, you know, um, and signing contract can, yeah, as you mentioned, come with uh, constraints, like, well, there should be, like, if, if you sign a contract with a brand, especially if there's finance attached to that, they should have a return on the investment because they're investing into you as an athlete. And I think for me, growing up, I've always thought, like, oh, my dream is to become, like, an Olympic champion in the 1500 and, like, be professional athletes and all of that. And I think I've had this dream fade away as I grew up and understood, like, more of what the sport means and, like, hearing, I don't know, stories about doping in some sports and like horrible things that can happen. And then as I worked into this industry and got to discover a whole new face and approach to the sport also, yeah, understanding like, like signing a sponsorship shouldn't be an end and like goals like, ah, oh, that's it, you've made it. It's like, I don't know, okay. It can totally. be another in managing how what you do. Um, and... Yeah, I'm not like I'm I'm not opposed to it. I'm having conversation right now to understand if I do do sign contracts, what it can enable me, what it can enable the brands, and how it can change what I would or wouldn't want to do um, in the future. Because one thing that I've quickly realized after winning UTMB is that if I want to continue into trail running, and I, I do at least for a few years, I can't do it in the way that I used to because now I want UTMB and so I it's going to take more time and more like just yeah for sure you don't fly that, under the radars anymore exactly but <laughs> and with a lot of things that we've discussed today like there's a lot of uh, brands also that are trying to figure out how they can get involved in growing the sport and stuff so yeah I'm um, I'm actively thinking about like what a sponsorship contract can help uh but yeah very aware that it comes with uh well comes with constraints and just less uh a little less freedom um and also even though i said that like i don't have the hopes that all of a sudden i'm going to revolutionize everything and nothing is going to be the same like it's we have to <laughs> take some perspective and like if i can have conversation that say I do have a contract, but I don't have to turn on my Instagram ever again. Maybe that's something. And maybe it can be the pathway for others that don't feel like it's something that is is good for them. Because uh, as you mentioned, it can be it can be unhealthy and not it's not because you're good at the sport that you should become good at like promoting yourself on on social media. So Yeah. We're we're required to be media, uh to be our own brands and yeah. a lot of things that don't have anything to do with the fact of being yeah. an athlete or run, running fast or like yeah producing a performance but i don't know if we if we should define that the profession like being a professional athlete uh involves all of those things but you know maybe uh i don't know but i think the the real freedom is when you are in a place to decide um, what place running occupies in your life, like how much time and attention and meaning you you want to place in in that activity versus yeah. everything else. I think that's the that's the great freedom that yeah, some people have, some some don't. Um, so yeah, you're yeah. you're you're probably in a good place. Well, no, it's, good. it's a good point that you make here and like some people embrace that you know communication side because they're naturally maybe better at it or they enjoy do, developing it and that's amazing because it also do a lot of good for the sport it brings yeah, yeah. a lot of, like bring a lot of spotlight into it and 
it made it very popular for sure yeah yeah exactly so yeah i think maybe more for this to probably not to become something that's automatic and it has to be like uh something that everyone does uh yeah maybe there's a little more flexibility in the future yeah um one other reaction after your win um there's been a lot of talk that with the professionalization of trail running and the increase in the level of the competition, um, it seems that you cannot reach the top or and win a race like UTMB unless you're like quit your daily job and go all in, like become a pro. Um, and you like some media wrote that you basically proved that this is simply not true. So on one hand, this gives some hope to the non-pros that you can still achieve amazing things even without having a professional contract or being a full-time professional runner. On the other hand, I th I think it also takes down the excuse that sometimes you hear from people that, okay, I'm not at that level because I'm not a professional runner. So again, there is not necessarily a meaning behind this and uh, your your case is... It's just a case, you know, it's a case study for sure, but this is something that just happens in the, in the sport. And it's, uh, it's one of the beauties of our sport that is unpredictable. And, yeah. uh, you know, there's not necessarily a meaning behind this, but how do you feel about it? Yeah. I mean, I think as we've discussed, the sport is still at its infancy, like it's still very small. And so, um, yeah, there's also not the same density as like if, if we were doing an open field race at cycling world champs, good luck for anyone to beat today yesterday on the race. Like it's, you know, it's like realistically speaking, we, I don't think we, we still have achieved I don't think we've achieved yet the same level of performance and density. Yeah. Uh, even though it's, it's, it's evolving. Um, but I come back to what I mentioned just earlier in, in the definition of what is professional and, um, I think I've also mentioned that in, in other discussions, but uh, do you know Mario Fraioli? Yeah, yes. I, I'm a subscriber to the Morning Shakeout yeah. newsletter. Great. So yeah, Mario Fraioli is a coach and uh, a friend of uh, Camila and I, because she, she's gotten to, to know him through work and he uh, has coached her for several years. And yeah, his newsletter is great. His podcast is great. One thing that I think I heard, I, I, I thought I had remembered him saying that earlier, but he mentioned that on the podcast earlier this year, that the idea of professionalization is you don't have to be a professionally professional athlete to train like a professional athlete, like kind of de, like demystifying the idea of what professional runners do on a daily basis. Because when you list all of the things, it, it's really simple. Like they rest, they sleep, they eat well. And sure, a lot of those things take time that maybe you don't have, but it's just a matter of like, how much are you wanting to take from other things that you're having in life in order to ensure that you have the mental space and physical space for, for that training? Because there's the hours of like running and during your, your intervals and your stretching and your strength work, but there's all of the other side of like, how are you mentally in order to approach that with your close ones with your partner with your family your friends and how much are you wanting to kind of shave on the sides and just do the bare minimum and at some point you're exposing yourself to more risks so i think that's something that's resonated for me a lot and the covid years have also helped for maybe me to build a a tighter discipline around my training and accept that yeah sometimes i have to be a little selfish and prioritize that and Hopefully, there's something that I still discuss well enough with my wife because we balance things with some moments sports take over what the plan is going to be for the weekend and some other moments it doesn't and it's the opposite. So, yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there is yeah, potential. Sure. And trail running also, because of where it's at, it has the beauty of allowing not everyone, but lots of people to be on the same start line. Uh continue with cycling like gravel cycling is a little bit similar right now where you could do some of the biggest races in the world and be on the same start line as some of the best athletes in the sport and that's not something that's true with every sport so yeah it's cool to to uh 
to be player in those uh, stages. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 You definitely answered my question. Okay. Um, I don't want to keep you for too long. Uh, you probably have other other things to get back to in your day. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we we will continue the conversation eventually. Uh, maybe face to face, maybe at some yeah. race or in some training camp. Would be cool. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, have a. I don't. I don't want to ask you what's next because I think it's it's not yet time to to ask you this question. And it, yeah, it probably bothers you <laughs> that so many people are asking you. Okay, what's next now? And what are you doing next year? Um, but yeah. Um, best wishes for whatever the future holds for you. Thank you. Same to you, Francesco. Yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll see see each other again uh, in person soon. Yeah, we almost uh, saw each other this year at Chakanat. So yes, yes, that's very good. <laughs> that, that would have been cool. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Bye.